From the bizarre world of the paranormal to the sinister secrets of the U.S. government, the Black Vault has become known worldwide as the premier spot for anything and everything conspiracy. Now, join me, John Greenwald Jr., as we dive into the research together in hopes to decipher these mysteries. This is the Black Vault Radio. That's right, this is the Black Vault Radio. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr. Thank you so much for tuning in, making BVRN your podcast of choice. A couple things to update you on before we get rolling. And by the way, today's guest is going to be pretty exciting and controversial, to say the least. Michael Horn, producer of a new film, The Silent Revolution of Truth, which I have watched in preparation for this show. And it's all about the Billy Meyer story. Michael Horn coming up in just a couple of minutes. But again, before we get going, I want to update you on a couple of occurrences on theblackvault.com. If you haven't visited recently, make sure you check it out. There's a lot of new documents on there. And for UFO believers, seekers, and even skeptics, there's a lot more UFO case files in the Black Vault Encyclopedia Project. If you're not familiar with this, it's a free online resource uh, running on the same engine as the Wikipedia uh, encyclopedia, the free encyclopedia that you can get a lot of information on. Well, the same engine runs the Black Vault Encyclopedia Project. And in short, it's just about anything and everything that you would want to know in relation to pretty much everything on the Black Vault, from conspiracy to military history to government history to UFO cases to the paranormal. Everything's pretty much on there. Well, one of the biggest draws are the UFO case files. Hundreds and hundreds of them around the globe have been archived here, many of them, and most of them actually, complete with photographic and visual evidence, uh, which includes photographs, a lot of film footage and uh, videotapes, even cell phone videos and photos are online. You can read the witness testimony, see the evidence, decide for yourself, and even discuss it right then and there. It's free to use, free to register, and you can actually edit anything on there. You can add your own research, help with grammar, it's... Um, Pretty much the possibilities are endless, so I uh, want to make sure that you guys know about that. Also, you know, with this political season coming, uh, some of you who have been watching uh, my ideas and, and posts on the Black Vault message forums, I want to say right here and now, because it is such a, um, s- such a popular election this year, uh, more so than, than in many of the ones in the past, and I would say it probably even surpasses the 04 election. This is going to be a critical turning point for the United States. Now, for many of you who have heard me before, you know that I have invested my life, literally the better part of my life, researching government secrets and conspiracies and, uh, and have uncovered a, a vast array of declassified government documents and I fight and fight and fight and get, get more. But I'm a, a, a pretty patriotic figure. I love the country that we live in and I love the government, uh, well... Maybe I shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> but I do support the government. Um, I love many of the things that they do, but of course not everything. Uh, but who does? That's, the, that's pretty much the joy of the country we live in. Well, I've expressed my support for John McCain, and uh, I know that 50% of you roughly agree with me, and probably 50% of you uh, will disagree with me and have pledged your support to Obama. Well, we're going to be keeping you updated on all the recent activity in the political arena here on the Black Vault Radio, giving you quick updates so you know what's going on, and uh, and I will definitely give headlines from both sides. I also want to know what you think, and before we get to the first commercial break, I want to hear your messages. You can leave me a voicemail at area code 641-715-3900. They're going to ask you for an extension. It's 21580, then hit the pound sign, and you can ramble off. Again, if you don't have a pen, don't worry, but it's 641-715-3900, extension 21580, hit the pound sign. Let me know what you think about your politician of choice and why. Keep it short and brief. You might hear it right here on the Black Vault Radio. I look forward to all of that. Michael Horn coming up on the Billy Meyer case. Quite controversial, so I'm looking forward to this. We'll be right back.
and welcome back to the Black Vault Radio. I am your host, John Greenwald Jr. Joining me on the phone, Mr. Michael Horn. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to join me here on the Black Vault Radio. John, it's my pleasure, and the very first thing I'd like to say is that it, I think it's very gracious of you to have invited me to be a guest, especially since I have been unfairly critical of you on your own uh, website <laughs> forum, misinterpreting and understand, misunderstanding your own position. So, again, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm ready to take the heat. Well, it is absolutely my pleasure, and no, 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 I won't be slinging any heat your direction. <laughs> uh, but for those listeners that don't exactly know what Michael just meant, uh, a couple months ago I was on Coast to Coast with George Norrie, and I was asked the question on the air, uh, one of many questions over the, over the course of four hours, and let me tell you, my ear was bleeding after that interview. But uh, one of the questions was what I thought about the Billy Meyer case. And uh, on the air I said I wasn't really... Uh, convinced by it, uh, wasn't uh, actually a believer, I believe is how I said it, but the uh, second part of that uh, answer was that I wasn't really knowledgeable, knowledgeable to really make an accurate opinion. And so that's why I've, I've invited Michael Horn on here, because I know that uh, some people heard that, and some agreed with me, and some disagreed with me. So I wanted to bring Michael on here. He's got a new film out called The Silent Revolution of Truth. It's all about the Billy Meyer story. I just watched it. It was very well done. The story is very strong. Uh, of course, there's going to be questions about a case that is so controversial. For anybody who is not familiar with Billy Meyer, just type it into Google, or go to theyfly.com. Again, theyfly.com. You can surf while you're listening if you're on the theblackvault.com right now. Just go to theyfly.com. That's Michael's website. It's all about his new film. Michael, let me pass this to you and stop babbling. Tell me a little bit about who Billy Meyer is and what your role in this is. Sure. Uh, as I characteristically describe him and changes every year with a new birthday, uh, Billy Meyer is a now 71-year-old man, a Swiss man, who has one arm. He lives in a rural part of Switzerland, a nice rugged hilly area. He claims that ever since he was a five-year-old boy some 66 years ago, that he's been having voluntary, wide-awake, face-to-face meetings with extraterrestrial human beings from another star system, of course, and that these uh, continue to this day. And uh, he has produced, uh, for better or for worse, as far as people are concerned, six categories of still irreproducible physical evidence and well over 24,000 pages of information hand-typed at speeds of up to 60 words per minute and more with one hand. And that uh, information contains a great body of what I call prophetically accurate information covering a wide range of sciences and world uh, event-related topics. And I became involved with this by finding the first book that came out on it in 1979. I uh, started to research everything I could in English. My German isn't great. Uh, and uh, it turns out that several years ago I asked Meyer when I was on a trip to Switzerland if I could officially represent them in the media, meaning that I would like to present their information as they wish it to be put out, with the conditions being that, A, I can disagree uh, with the information, I can publish uh, contrary opinions, which I have done. People don't know that, but it's true. Uh, that we will not pay each other for this, that they will not pay me to represent them, and I won't pay them for the privilege of it so that we can keep that relatively clean mm -hmm. because uh, you know people would and certainly still do accuse me of uh, doing this because I'm getting some payoff from them. I don't uh, do that. So all the work, with the exception of if people buy our films or products or something like that, everything I do, travel, research, film production, radio shows, etc., is all done in my own dime. I see. So, so you... Are you are you not a firm believer in 100% of Billy's story or his evidence? Or oh. has it turned out that uh, once you saw it, you absolutely are a believer? Well, I, I actually do, not just semantically, but I shy away from the word believe or believer because in the entire body of the information of the Meyer case in the conversational transcripts that are alleged to have uh, you know, involved not only Meyer but these extraterrestrial humans, if they indeed exist, they have uh, only used the word, uh, two words together, I believe, once in thousands of pages that I could find. And that was mm. when uh, the, uh, we'll just say alleged once, so if people have an, uh, you know, a problem with the idea that uh, this could be real, mm -hmm. it's all right. But we'll just say the extraterrestrial, one of them said to Meyer, I believe the name of the woman you're looking for or thinking about is such and such. So if for my own, uh, my own position is this. There are things in this case that I am convinced are true because I've done enough hard work and research to, to ferret out the best I could 
uh, any corroborating or contradictory information. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I don't base my opinions on the physical evidence, even though I think that that's, as I say, I claim it's still irreproducible, certainly with any technology available to anyone at the time that Meyer took his photos, films, sound recordings, when the met metal samples were presented, uh, the most recent physical evidence being the seven-fingered handprints. I mean, it's very wild stuff, but mm -hmm. that you can put all the physical evidence aside when you get into the information. And, uh, you know, yes, it's not all impeccably documented, but enough of it is whereby we can say this was printed and published at this time, and there you go. How does a Swiss farmer know about the, you know, the moons of, uh, and rings of Jupiter five months before the U.S. probe gets there to, you know, to identify, get photograph the information, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we have just dozens, if not hundreds, of these that I've found in the English language. And in Switzerland, they have volumes of books where they literally cut out the clippings from newspapers years later and then go and, you know, paste them and post them and, mm -hmm. and republish with the original published documentation that Meyer put out beforehand. So it's a long-winded answer, but I do get excited about that information. So the rest of it I consider speculative, meaning I cannot prove, uh, and no one can at this point, things that are claimed to have occurred thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands, or millions of years ago, or things that have not yet uh, occurred in the future. There's just simply no way. But what I detected here, just for the sake of really con condensing so people will know wh where I'm coming from and why I jump up and down about it, here's what happened for me. Uh, I came into possession of the original uh, 1,800 pages of English translated contact notes in 1986. They were given to me by a guy whose name was Ralph Amagran, who later changed his name to Alex Collier and started claiming he was a contactee. And we, we we can or we can avoid going to that. I don't care. But the point was, I was very grateful for him. He did give me the Meyer material. I read it. Uh, I was fascinated by it, but couldn't do too much more. I stuck it under my bed. Two years after having these read these transcripts, which were the time period of 1975 to 78, I opened up a local newspaper and saw an, an article that claimed to be a new discovery by the eminent Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in California about the connection between A-bomb testing and the ozone damage. As I read it with the specific percentages and everything else they were talking about, I kept having this funny feeling like, this isn't new. I've read this. How could I possibly know this already? Mm -hmm. And it was then that I reached under the bed, pulled out the first 100-page block of the Meyer contact note transcripts, and within a minute or so, there it was, this same information. And they're also referring, Meyer is getting this information, and he's saying things like, oh, yes, just as uh, I was first told in 1951. So it was like, what is this about? And to, to make it succinct enough that we can <laughs> converse, and I'm not to, on my end just chopping over everything here, mm -hmm. this was the first of a number of uh, such discoveries, if you will, whereby a new discovery is announced, and yet I can go back into Meyer's previously published documented material, find the information there, and that's what really set me off. So these revelations that he was getting were from extraterrestrial visitors that were giving him notes on the future, future scientific discoveries. Was this on world events as well? Was it all of the above? Yes, all of the above. And the interesting thing to me was that a lot of this was simply given in a conversational tone. They'd be talking to him about any number of things, including some very boring, mundane matters having to do with people that uh, he was working with who were trying to help him or how to build something or he needed to do this or that. You know, you, stuff you want to gloss over because it's really boring, which made it all the more authentic because right. why would a guy sit around and, you know, fill volumes with that stuff? Well, yeah, they would tell him in a conversation, that, and by the way, uh, seven months from now on, uh, you know, February 29th in Argentina, there will be such and such will happen. 212 people will die. To, I mean, this kind of specificity, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, wars, assassinations, uh, scientific discoveries, you name it. And then there are things that are given or presented to him as prophecies. And basically the prophecies tend to be, uh, according to this information, original information that's quite ancient that has been in the keeping of the play are and these extraterrestrials for a very very long time and that they have found that it's timely now to 
bring this information forward, and Meyer should publish it, and blah, blah, blah. And so there's quite a bit of that that is simply in the, given in the form of prophecy. So I think one of the biggest skeptical questions to this point is why Billy Meyer? Sure. Why isn't it, you know, five people, ten people from different corners of the globe, a world leader? Why yeah. Billy? Well, in, in a way it's easy to answer, although the answer won't satisfy everybody. There's two parts that you just actually gave there, which is, in a sense, why Billy is an individual uh, and why not other people, these other people, or any given number of other people. So let's give you the one that's going to be the hardest for people to swallow <laughs> at first, and that is that according to these extraterrestrials, uh, reincarnation is a fact of life. It's not a belief or you know, something we don't believe in, as per any philosophical, religious, atheistic belief for or against something. These people either claim to know something or they don't know it. They claim to know that something called the human spirit reincarnates countless millions of times in the course of evolution, and that every human being has a spirit, as well as this temporary construct called the human soul. Now, one of the things that is, you know, quite interesting here is that um, we have uh, a claim that Meyer's spirit, that Meyer himself is an enormously, uh, his spirit, a non-personal essence, is an enormously, enormously ancient uh, spirit and has performed this task many times before in our history, and that this is simply the current incarnation, the current personality that is, for what they say, for the final time carrying out this particular mission on our planet that we may have true teachings about kind of what it's all about and what we as individual humans and collectively should be doing for ourselves and for our survival. Okay. Where... I kind of lost my train of thought there, but I mean, where is Billy now? I mean, you're you're out in the forefront representing him in the media. Mm -hmm. Some might question, well, why isn't Billy out there representing himself? He doesn't seek to do that. As I say, um, he's 71 at this time. There have been 21 documented attempts in his life, kidnapping attempts in his children. He has an uh, older daughter who is hospitalized as a paraplegic from an automobile crash, has an 11-year-old daughter who was born with a cord wrapped around her neck and suffers from irreversible brain damage. He has duties uh, pertaining to his you know, maintenance of his property and work with the people that live there and the land. Plus, he writes constantly to get the information that these people and his own efforts are bringing forth, and that is his primary duty. And they also say, hey, uh, unfortunately this is going to take humanity maybe seven, eight hundred years before all of this is fully implemented, and his task is to get the information down, get it out there, and let other people bring it forth into the world who are interested. It's their responsibility, not his. They do it in German. We have to do it in, in the rest of the languages on Earth. Now, we're coming up to a break here, but in short, does Billy care if people believe him? No. Why not? Because belief is the least important, least valuable thing. He cares more, if he cares, if he, let's put it that way, that people will be provoked enough by this information to do their own research and, even more importantly, hard thinking and reasoning inside themselves on a thought-by-thought -thought basis to help to turn around the dead-end direction of this world and as it is also largely embodied by the policies, unfortunately, of our own country and others that are plunging us into otherwise enormous catastrophe. And he's been warning about this since 1951. The film is called The Silent Revolution of Truth. Check it out, the trailer, I should say, online, theyfly.com. No matter what, real or not, well done documentary. Great story. More on this when we come back.
Welcome back to the Black Vault Radio. We're talking to Michael Horn, author of, or producer, I should say, of The Silent Revolution of Truth, a new film about the Billy Meyer story, quite controversial to say the least. Check it out online. The trailer is at theyfly.com. That's also Michael's site. You can find a lot more information there, theyfly.com. Michael, with a new phone, sounding a little bit different. We had the last one die on us. Uh, Welcome back to the show. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jeff. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, Billy's life away from UFOs. He has a, a quite fascinating story, which I, which, I, um, which I saw with great interest on The Silent Revolution of Truth. He was nicknamed The Phantom. Tell me why. Yes. Well, uh, Meyer, during a certain course of his life, embarked on uh, about 12 years of travel through something like 42 countries, hundreds and something odd thousand miles, basically on foot, hitchhiking, taking on many different, uh, you might say, jobs or occupations, literally hundreds of them, studying the world's major religions. All of this prompted uh, by the extraterrestrial tutorage that he got for many years, starting at five. And he also rubbed shoulders with and met many of the people who were or would become major players on the world stage. And um, I'll get to the fan thing, but real briefly, at age 10, he met Gandhi. Ultimately, from there, he, he met so many people from Tito Franco, uh, King Hussein, all the way to Saddam Hussein. And then it was in the Middle East for, I think, three different police departments, one in West Pakistan, Turkey, and India, one in each of those countries at least, that he performed duties uh, under, the, as you say, the nickname of the Phantom. And we show photographs of, of him in this garb and everything in the Middle East during this time. He was hired by these people to apprehend and bring in the most brutal of the members of their society, you can call them members of the society, that is the serial killers and mass murderers. And Meyer had, uh, he still does, he has nerves of steel. That's the only way I can put it, because obviously the first time a bullet misses your head, there's a little invisible banner that says, we suggest a career change. (laughs) And Meyer, you know, he's he's never bowed to that. And I've talked to people who've witnessed at least 12 of the assassination attempts. There's no doubt that stuff's real. So in the Middle East, he was hired to go out and bring these people in. And he was fully armed and prepared to do it, and he did this job. And funny thing was, I was just visiting with him a few weeks ago uh, in late May, and we brought this thing up again about the Phantom. And, and <laughs> Billy, I mean, you, you just have to meet the guy. He's just a sincere guy with a great sense of humor, but very, very contained, you know, kind of conservative, really. Mm-hmm. And he leaned across, and he lifted up his hand. He said to me, kind of pointing his finger in the air, I just want you to know that when I was the Phantom, I never killed anybody. <laughs> and I laughed. I said, okay, Billy, I believe it. He says, no, no, it's important because, yes, these people, you know, I have to shoot people, but I always wounded them. You know, if they drew a weapon on me, I would wound them so that the authorities, then they would come and take these people and, and you know, in for a... Uh, for trial and all that he did, but I never killed anybody. Now, did, was he having was he having experiences during this time as well? I mean, you said they started when he was five years old. Yeah, now I'd, I'd actually have to. There was a period for eleven years, then uh, from uh, nineteen forty-two to about fifty-three. Then I think there was the woman Asket uh, for the next eleven years. Who, so he was probably having some contacts at this time, and I, I just don't have all that in front of me. I remember a lot of stuff, but sometimes not all the dates. Uh, and his trips with Asket, and he described some of that in the film, too, travels into the future and into the past and all sorts of stuff. So th- he was having certain contacts, and when he was in India uh, uh, in 1964, we also show that, and we also, of course, show the interview with Pobal Cheng, who was, was in India as a young girl at this ashram while witnessing along with probably a couple hundred other people the ships hovering over the ashram and Meyer walking around the grounds of the ashram with Asket and then this woman who's a retired UN diplomat I might add Asket uh, was seen by her not only walking with Billy but Pobal Cheng said well the woman would come into her room at night and while she's falling asleep and just sit there as a nice present stroking her hair and she said, you know, it's funny, many times I'd wake up in the morning and I always felt I knew a lot more, and a lot more about people than when I fell asleep the night before. <laughs> so, you know, and, and of course we also show there was a, a write-up in the New Delhi Statesman newspaper in 64 uh, with, you know, Edward Albert Meyer claims that he's having visits with extraterrestrials, and that's when he took his first 
photographs of the ships. We show those. So uh, when people claim that Meyer has been hoaxing his photographs, you have to figure out how in 1964, in the middle of almost nowhere in India, he's getting clear photographs, very clear of Ascot ship, as well as photos of up to seven other craft at the same time. And he's got witnesses, and there were yeah. you know, villagers. And so that, That's what I found interesting from the film. There were actually lots of witnesses. When we come wow. back, it's already the bottom of the hour. More with Michael Horn on the Billy Meyer case. Stay tuned. You're listening to BVRN, the Black Vault Radio Network. Back to the Black Vault Radio. I am your host, John Greenwald Jr., joined with Michael Horn today, talking about his new film, The Silent Revolution of Truth. Check out the trailer at theyfly.com. I just watched it myself. It's a fascinating story about Billy Meyer, true or not. If it's hoaxed, there was a lot of stuff hoaxed. There was a lot of evidence fabricated. There was a lot of witnesses that were convinced to hop on the Billy Meyer train and talk about their experiences. So, real or not, it's a great story. The Silent Revolution of Truth. Check it out online, theyfly.com. Michael, I want to get into how much visual evidence there is to support <clears throat> Excuse me, all these stories. And I'll kind of pass it to you on this. I mean, there's tons sure. of photographs. We're not talking about one or two photos. We're talking about a lot, including film footage, the days before Photoshop, the days before computer, uh, CGI, computer graphics. Um, let me have yeah. your thoughts on that. What, what are the stats behind it? Well, the stats are that uh, the majority, 99% of Meyer's evidence, photographic film evidence, uh, and even video, the one video he took, were all produced, to use that word, prior to home computers in Photoshop and taken by a one-armed man basically in the boonies, with the exception of the photos uh, taken in India, which are 1964, remote India, that no one can figure out how they were taken if he hoaxed it. All of the stuff that he took in Switzerland uh, and again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, clear daytime photos and films, up to three and even four of the objects in a frame. Um, skeptics hurl lots and lots of silly claims about how it could have been done. And, you know, uh, I'm sure for the people that are listening to your show, many of whom I've offended in person one way or the other, <laughs> it's not personal with me. And I don't mean to, and I never really mean to offend people. I, I don't have a problem offending points of view, and sometimes names get attached. Let's 
let's be specific about these photos and films. Uh, in our film package of the Silent Revolution of Truth, we have a section where there's a skeptic, Derek Bartholomus from IIG, uh, the CFI West IIG, who we gave quite a bit of screen time to presenting his best case uh, and a best case, which really, uh, with uh, CFI IIG, starts back in 2001, when I challenged them to back up their claim that the Meyer evidence was a quote-unquote easily duplicated hoax. Um, Derek came on. He had a, he didn't allow us to interview him, but he made a you know scripted presentation that was quite long. We said, look, we're not going to be able to use the whole thing here. We've reviewed it. I'm going to put some rebuttal into some of the stuff, we'll, and if you sign off on it, we'll put it in the film package. He did. And after it came out, I then kind of, you know, pulled out a little more ammunition that I did not want to start uh, with during the rebuttal process because he, I don't think, would have signed off. And that was that the argument that he and these other skeptics have been making for a long time is Meyer used model UFOs and model trees to fake these photos and this film and this and that. And Well, it turned out that he had to admit that that was actually the weakest part of his argument which was actually also the foundation of his argument. So it didn't help the rest of it. And here's what we've got. Nobody to date, and I mean nobody, could produce even a photo of a model tree, such as they claim Meyer used, or a miniature tree. We have Mr. Jeff Fritzman, who's a, uh, a UFO aficionado. He's a photographer, a model maker, and he even cultivates miniature trees or did. He claimed that Meyer did this, and he claimed he could duplicate Meyer's photos. He made some very nice photos, as I've often said, of a nice little model UFO, but he neglected a couple of important things. One, he couldn't get it to look like it was really in the distance, like Meyer's larger objects were. And two, he absolutely refused to pose his model UFO with one of his cute little model trees, bonsai trees or whatever, to prove the point that this is what Meyer obviously did. Mm -hmm. We have skeptics literally even in France and other places that still scream about model trees. I have been to Switzerland ten times in the past nine years, and I've driven around the country, so I've photographed a lot of the trees, the kinds of trees that Meyer photographed the UFOs next to. And I've even made a comment, and it's probably you know, eluded people's reasoning. When you go to Switzerland and you go to this rural, rugged area, there are hillsides sometimes where there's only one tree in the middle of nowhere. Or then there's, you know, some, there's a number of other trees, but they're farther apart. And they look very vibrant and, and just too good to be true because it's a very vibrant earth there. It's a very vibrant plant uh, and, and you know, tree life. And the people there care very much for their land and property. Things are clean, and, and they often look too good to be true, but they're not. It's the way, <laughs> unfortunately, it's the way it is. And until somebody can come forward just with the model trees and mm -hmm. show us these model trees, well, it destroys the argument, and Derek actually had to retract that. Well, after he retracted that, he went to the special effects experts that I referred to in the film. They're known as Uncharted Territory. They are the people who won the Academy Award for special effects for Independence Day. And I had visited them, now it's maybe three years ago, shown them Myers photos and films, and I took some notes, because when I showed them a, a film of Myers, and I said, the skeptics say that this is a model. These two guys broke out laughing. They may not want to admit it today, but they pointed at the screen and they said, you know, those aren't models. We know models, and those aren't models. I said, okay, can you duplicate these films? They said, well, if we could, we have to go to CGI. So that's, of course, mentioned in our film, The Silent Revolution of Truth. And Derek then went back just in January of this year to the guys at Uncharted Territory to try to get them to retract, and you know, that I was lying, they never said this stuff. And he came away with a, with a quote that didn't help him because they said, well, we don't remember the meeting exactly that way, but we do remember seeing this one film of a UFO circling the tree. And um, by golly, uh, if, if this is a hoax, well, I, I can tell you their exact, exact words on it because Derek got them to send him an email that he probably right now is kicking himself that they ever, ever responded. And they said this, but to reflect on the statement that's in the film, I also remember seeing a shot on the Super 8 reel that showed a UFO circling around a fairly tall tree. According to that shot, we said that we can't conclusively say whether it's real or not, but it seemed impossible to stage that kind of a shot with a miniature. It would have had to be hanging on a very tall crane with wires. 
but even then the movements would be hard to achieve. So yes, in regards to that shot, we mentioned that we could definitely do it today with CG, but at the time these were supposedly shot, it would have been very hard, probably even impossible to fake this kind of shot. Now that's from the owners of uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. Now I say to any reasonable person who's not out to prove the case real or prove it false, but who wants to discover the truth, tell me, when you have Academy Award winning special effects experts commenting on a film shot in 1975 by a one armed Swiss farmer, and they're talking to you about cranes and wires and it's very hard, near impossible to uh, even impossible to fake, wouldn't a fair-minded person want to start becoming fair-minded about the whole thing? Mm -hmm. And I'll go, I'll go farther just to jump about photographic and film evidence. Um, there is a, 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 a clip when we show, we show a number of Myers film clips in, the, in, the, in our film, and one of which, of course, has three of the UFOs hovering over a valley. There's a tree branch in the foreground. The three UFOs are hovering. This is film. One of them is rotating uh, clearly, and each of them is, is changing the spatial relationship distance between them very subtly throughout the film segment. You see them each moving on their, on their own. Now, you, we're supposed to believe that over a valley where you can't, how are you going to suspend anything? You've got three model UFOs, one of them clearly rotating all silver, reflecting the sunlight, being filmed by a one-armed man, and nobody notices this? Now... There's a skeptic in France who's finally come down. He's, this is all about models and models. So he, somebody wrote him, and he committed to saying that Meyer used models that were one to three foot in diameter. Well, that means that in that shot, there's a, a total of, of nine feet from, from three to nine feet in diameter models being somehow suspended and controlled over a valley while a one-armed man films them. Now... I'll jump further. We show a film clip that uh, is referred to by, by Derek, the skeptic, and I deliberately stayed away from commenting too much about this in, the, in our you know, film presentation, and it is the one where the film uh, uh, captures the UFO apparently jumping and going a distance away from the foreground of the center of the frame. People would be able to see this and know what I'm talking about, and partially dipping behind a hillside just a little bit. Now, this part about the dipping and whether the, the object jumps in a fraction of a second is what the skeptics have focused most on. But I finally decided I'm going to pull out the other shoe on this, which means that I will tell you now why it's actually impossible, and I guarantee you impossible, for that to have been faked. And it's simply this. Now, I know people are probably not looking at that film clip right now, but hopefully they'll revisit and listen again to this when they do. The UFO that is seen, let's just, for the benefit of the doubt, very close to a hilltop that our skeptical friend in France says is from one to three feet in diameter has a number of problems. One, the, the hillside is clearly a large distance away. Using the measurement of one to three feet, we can create units that represent the UFO on either side of the UFO to find that we have stretches of from 20 to maybe 50 feet on either side of the UFO that's supposedly a mere model that has to be controlled by a minimum of three people, meaning one from the left side, one from the right side, and one from the top. Now, why do we focus on this? Because the UFO is tilted at an angle also. The angle of the UFO, when compared to the angle of the downward sloping hillside, creates an X, meaning the whole slide slopes down to the right, the UFO down to the left. Now, presuming that you have some people controlling this as a model at a distance of where there's at least, let's just say, 20 feet on the left and 30 feet on the right, when you take the angle that is created by the rim of the ship, you have somebody that is standing significantly low, as a matter of fact, very low, and someone else who's standing probably 40 feet in the air on the right-hand side. Now, I realize in describing this that it's a little obscure and abstract, when you see this clip and you focus on that part, you're going to realize this problem now has two people, who, one of whom has to be on a crane somewhere that can move across the countryside, and then as the ship moves back up into the top center of the screen, and it does, it goes from the hillside back up to the top of the screen, it remains at an angle and does not rotate, meaning that if this was suspended from the top, 
which means he would have to suspend it from the middle of the ship rather than from the top to, to an angle. hate to be technical here about it, but this is so crucial. Then it would be rotating around its axis in a lopsided way. There is zero rotation. The ship simply moves up from the hillside smoothly to the top of the screen. Now, what, let's just say that you heard all that and you, you're not quite sure what all that means, but you will take a look on your own time, you being the skeptic, whoever you are out there. <laughs> you're going to understand if you're fair-minded, that this is a physical, technical impossibility. If the, if the, and they were skeptical, and they still are about UFOs. The guys at uh, Uncharted Territory said that it's even impossible for Meyer have to fake the film where you've got a, a tree in front of a farmhouse and the UFOs circling the tree. Now you've got an object that is moving from a, a distance to the foreground, uh, it, it, defying any controllability whatsoever. And then if people say, well, how far did it really move? Well, we've got an estimate from one to three feet on the size of the object. If you take an object, from, you can take three objects, one foot, two foot, and three foot. You take a look at your film clip, and you take a camera, and you move your object so that it has the same relative size on screen for one foot. And you're going to understand that we are dealing with impossibility. Then if we go to the clip where the UFO is over Meyer's head, and it's a model only from one to three feet, and you've got the sky way above it, and it's in the distance, the game is over for the skeptics. It is simply done. Now, does it make it extraterrestrial? No. We don't know that. We can, we can get to that. But does it, does, is there any possibility that this man faked this? I say absolutely none, and every skeptic that I have challenged, put a model UFO by a tree and give me one photo like that. Make a film. Jeff Richmond claimed he could make a film or a video that uh, significantly uh, duplicating Myers. He never produced it. None of these people can. And I understand that this, look, as we say, this is either the biggest hoax or it's the most important story in all of human history. This so far exceeds the relevance and importance of Roswell, which I I'm convinced happened because I learned about it when I was 14 years old from a kid whose dad was in the Air Force in the mm -hmm. 50s. So we're talking about something that is happening for a reason. And that's what is getting to me here. People have got to somehow get past, resolve their issues about authenticity of the evidence in the case and get into the meat of the matter. But I'm glad to address any of the physical evidence. Well, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of physical evidence, and there's also a lot of criticism with your with your own admission. I mean, there's just a, these photos and and videos. In some sense, despite the technical complications it would take to pull something like that off, it's like you know people are going to say, "Well, it's too good," and that's not a yeah. fair argument at all. But that really oh. is what 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 comes to mind. Now, let's let me switch gears a little bit and talk about sure. what is probably the most controversial sets of photos, and that's the wedding cake UFO. Now, I think if you look at this, just without any type of analysis or scanning the thing in at super high resolution, you just look at the photo, and it just appears to be a model sitting close to the camera with the house in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and then I even saw one skeptic try and say, well, look at this notch on the side of it here. It looks like the garbage can lid. I wanted to get your take on this, because you deal with this, or, or part of this, in the film. And I must commend you on that. I mean, you bring in the skeptical arguments. It's not like you just gloss over them and don't even deal with them. But what is your reaction to that? Well, sure. Well, let's uh, and keep me on track with this because there's so much to comment about. For instance, just let's jump to the thing about this is a broken part or this is a, a thing for a garbage can. Let's try to keep one thing in mind. If, and this is in capital letters, if these people exist and if they indeed have this kind of craft and technology, let's at least hold hope that they're a little smarter than we are. And let's at least hope that rather than succumbing to our very understandable but not productive demand that everything be sugar-coated and handed to us on a silver platter and that they jump through hoops, that they're going to play the game according to their own rules and according to rules that they have come up with or adhere to because they would be in our best interest as far as they are concerned. Now, that's a big leap, and I don't mean to say a leap of faith, but I happen to think that these people are smarter than we are. I also think they've made mistakes and that they're not perfect is a given. The wedding cake craft, first of all, nobody, and I mean nobody to date, will even undertake making such a thing. Now, Jeff Ritzman put a, uh, at one point put some cake pans together in a couple of ball bearings or Christmas ornaments, 
and he stops at that point, and understandably, because it doesn't look anything like this kind of craft. I discovered a few things additionally about the wedding cake ship that I actually then checked out with Meyer in the For What It's Worth department that showed uh, some rather interesting things. But when you look at this object, and we get to see this object from a number of angles in a number of uh, lighting set settings, and uh, glowing in two different colors. Now, I have been on the property numerous times exactly, standing exactly where that craft was seemingly set down, or if people want to think it's a model. The distance actually to the house from where that photograph was taken is very small. And I have uh, an article on my page on the wedding cake ship. Uh, it's, you know, it's something about wedding cake hoax or whatever. And I take photographs from almost the exact same spot. And what I did was, I had a guy who I know to be over six feet tall stand in approximately the area. I have him hold a box that's about, I don't know, 12 to 14 inches high, a couple feet uh, in uh, diameter. I take a close-up of this box, and I do all of this to show the difficulty of, uh, of obscuring the amount of space necessary to obscure and get a clear photograph of a foreground object and a clear enough photograph of the house in the background. It doesn't happen. The, the height of the object, and I, I try to take it... Hold, as hold as on, as Michael. As i got to interrupt you. We're coming up to our last break. Check sure. out that page, theyfly.com. Look for the wedding cake UFO. I'll let Michael finish that story right after this break. Sorry, Michael. We'll be right back to BBRN Black Vault Radio Network. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to the Black Vault Radio. We're finishing up with Michael Horn on the Billy Meyer case and his new film, The Silent Revolution of Truth. I'm telling you, the hour flies way too quickly. There's a ton of stuff to cover here. There's more than two hours worth of material in the film, so definitely check it out, theyfly.com. Michael, you were telling me you tried to replicate that photo with the, mo- with the supposed model, as the skeptics would say, and the UFO, as Billy would say, that landed in his property. You couldn't do it. Well, meaning I tried to create a, an effect with a human being and another object of known size, fairly large, that would give us enough occlusion of the, of the space to show that it was you know, probable that he did it. Now, some people are going to say, well, you're leaving out this about for shortening and blah, blah. So we put up on the website, it's been there a long time, people can find it, the video that Meyer shot in broad daylight of the wedding cake graph, approximately anywhere from two to 400 feet away from the camera. And hovering next to a tree, virtually motionless, although there's a very tiny up and down movement. Any time anybody can duplicate that, again, they haven't even been able to duplicate a tree, this UFO, the wedding cake UFO model, is virtually irreproducible. Uh, they know that it would have cost $25,000 to make it in 1980. So let people, you know, fret about that all they want. Um, I, I have a comment that takes us off of that just a little in this sense, and I say this. People focus a lot on Roswell. As I said before, Roswell happened. I'm, I'm well convinced that it did. But the government loves the fact that all you UFO people want to rehash Roswell because it's like having your foot nailed to the floor and going around in a circle. <laughs> there is zero remaining evidence. There is nothing other than getting people to froth and do Larry King shows about Roswell that will lead us out of the dark that we are plunging headlong into. If people will visit the website, they fly. They don't have to buy a thing. Read the, the prophecies from 1951, from 58, the, the Hanak prophecies about what happens to America if we continue on this path, uh, allegedly given to Meyer in 1987. There are things in, uh, I can prove about the early publication of prophetic information. I put out a DVD in 2004 in which I refer to, to information I read in 86, published by Meyer in 81, about the riots in Paris, the burning, the looting, the connection to radical Islam, etc. People have got to understand, if you don't get it now from the floods and the rains, the fires sweeping California, the earthquakes, the coming intensity of the increase that we're going to see now in environmental, geophysical related changes, the increase in hostilities and aggression and war, as foretold long ago by the great prophets in this particular lineage, then we are wasting our time with UFOs. This has always been the purpose of bringing of the prophets bringing forward information. It's not to worship people. It's not to deify people. It's not to create religions and cults and belief systems. It's to help humanity redirect away from what is otherwise going to be an unimaginable horror that gets closer all the time. It is our individual, personal, and collective responsibilities to redirect this. If we want to attack a guy in Switzerland who just happens to be the current low charisma, pot belly, gray bearded farmer with one arm that they chose for various reasons to bring forward this information, that we might have the wit and wisdom to wake up, to stop entertaining ourselves and becoming a new generation of pod people, like in the invasion of the body snatchers, now with the iPod people plugging our heads up full of stuff day in and day out. Folks, this is what it's about. There's no money involved in that. There's no profit with an F for anybody if this whole thing, our world, goes down the tubes. They have laid out ways in which, if we wish to review it, we can start to elevate ourselves out of this destructive path. It's up to us solely, as humans on this planet, to do that. If you are mad at Billy Meyer or the uh, alleged ETs in this case, or me or anybody else, you're wasting your time. I hope you'll be inspired to at least do the research, the thinking, and the work. Ask questions, email me, throw things my way, if you will. Eventually I respond, and I'll direct you to all the free stuff you possibly have. If you want to buy a film, it's great. It helps me to do my work. Thanks so much. Theyfly.com. Michael, thank you so much. We are fresh out of time. It went way too fast. Theyfly.com. Michael Horn, thank you. We'll see you next time on the Black Vault Radio.